Good evening, and welcome to Oregon's Virtual Out Loud event. I'm Robin Wheeler-Grange, Head of State, Local, and Regional Public Affairs and Outreach at Argonne, and I'm pleased that so many of you have joined us for this forum. Let me begin with some housekeeping notes, uh, just to help you get the most out of tonight's event. Your video and audio were automatically turned off when you joined the event. The public chat has also been disabled. So to ask questions, please use the Q&A module by clicking the icon that looks like two talk bubbles. Throughout this event, the moderator will include your questions in the discussion and have our presenters answer as many questions as possible live. You can also use the Q&A module to seek technical assistance. So for example, if you can't hear the presenter or see the slides, use the Q&A feature to let us know your issue and a member of our team will help you troubleshoot. Finally, please note that this event is being recorded and will be posted for viewing at a later time. By participating in this session, attendees consent to being recorded. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Argonne's Laboratory Director, Paul Kearns. Paul, take it away. Oh, Paul, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you for letting me know. Uh, welcome to our virtual out loud lecture. Thank you very much, Robin. I'm Paul Kearns and I have the honor of leading Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, this year, Argonne is celebrating its 75th anniversary. In 1946, we were established with a research focus on nuclear energy. Today, Argonne is distinguished as a national laboratory by the breadth, depth, and impact of our multidisciplinary research. We accelerate the science that drives US prosperity and security. But tonight, for our last out loud of the year, we thought we'd go back to the future. We will discuss our founding mission and its legacy and the fascinating research our scientists are doing with partners around the globe to advance nuclear science in a peaceful way today. So let's go back to the dawn of the atomic age at the very beginning of Argonne and nuclear energy. Argonne traces its roots to the Manhattan Project, the American-led R&D project of World War II under the Stagfield bleachers at the University of Chicago in 1942, physicist Enrico Fermi and his team achieved a key breakthrough by creating the world's first controlled self-sustaining nuclear reaction. A year after the war, the federal government established Argonne with the founding mission of developing peaceful uses for nuclear power. Our mission continues at Argonne today uh, with our participation in an international program that works to reduce the risk of nuclear proliferation. Although we don't have a DeLorean with a working flux capacitor like the one in the movie Back to the Future, we have created other forward-looking tools. Argonne leads in nuclear science because our lab developed some of the first experimental nuclear reactors. At Argonne West in Idaho, which was part of our lab for many years, but now is our sister lab, Idaho National Laboratory, we built the Experimental Re Reactor One. It led a string of uh, just four light bulbs really to produce the world's first nuclear generated electricity in 1951. For several decades, decades after that, we conducted groundbreaking research at the experimental boiling water reactor in Chicago Pile 5 in Illinois. While we built and operated the experimental reader reactor 2 in Idaho, those reactors demonstrated uh, principles still embodied in the design of advanced reactors today. Between 1965 and 1994, the experimental breeder reactor two reached outputs of about 20 megawatts of electricity at full operation. That's enough to power about 2000 homes. In 2020, Illinois, six nuclear power plants with 11 total reactors produced 55, 58% of the state's electricity. The development of today's commercial uh, nuclear reactors is based on the design concepts of these early reactors and the information produced from the re reactor experiments conducted at Argonne. All reactors on our campus were to be decommissioned by 2004, but our research in this area continues as we'll hear about this evening. To go into more detail about our fascinating work in this field, we'll engage in conversation with three of our leading nuclear scientists, John Stevens, a nuclear reactor physicist and senior nuclear engineer, 
Laura Jamieson, I'm a material scientist and principal nuclear engineer, and Mark Williamson, the director of Argonne's Chemical and Fuel Cycles Technology Division, who will moderate our discussion. We're grateful to have Mark, John, and Laura uh, for being here uh, with us this evening. Uh, before I hand things over to Mark, I would like to thank all of you for attending our last out loud lecture for our 75th year. I personally appreciate having this opportunity to share Argonne's mission and success with you. With your support, we will continue to accelerate the science and technology that drive U.S. prosperity and security. Mark, can you please begin tonight's program? Thank you, Paul, for this opportunity and good, good evening, everyone. When you think of nuclear science, what's the first thing that comes to mind? For many, it's likely the global concern about nuclear weapons getting into the wrong hands. But for Argonne nuclear engineers, nuclear science is about much, much more than that. Nuclear science is advancing solutions to meet global challenges in many ways. For example, nuclear power is a clean energy source and it is the, lar the second largest source of low carbon electricity in the world behind hydropower. And the energy from nuclear power systems can be used in water desalination, thus providing a freshwater source for millions while avoiding the use of fossil fuels for the same purpose. Argonne's at the forefront of research and development in nuclear science as demonstrated by the numerous um, activities taking place at the laboratory involving many science disciplines, including biology, environmental science, chemical and molecular engineering, transportation, and combustion research. All of this exciting work has its genesis in a controlled nuclear reaction. So how does that process work? In the fission process, an atom is bombarded by a neutron to produce an unstable nucleus at the core of the atom. The nucleus of that unstable atom fissions or splits into two or more smaller atoms which are known as fission products. And the additional neutrons released during that process can in initiate a sustained reaction of continuous fission. This fission process produces a tremendous amount of energy that can be used to produce electricity, or it can be used for other beneficial purposes. Tonight, we're going to have a robust conversation about the exciting and impactful nuclear science taking place at Argonne. Let's start by listening to a brief excerpt of an audio recording of our two present presenters. This recording is part of an oral history project titled Argonne Voices, created to highlight the people and science of Argonne in recognition of our 75th anniversary. For 75 years, Argonne National Laboratory has accelerated the science and technology that drive U.S. security and prosperity. To celebrate, we're capturing the stories of the people who made it happen. This is Argonne Voices. So John, was there a specific person that really encouraged you to pursue a career in science? My 10th grade chemistry teacher. She spotted my curiosity and probably laughed at me that I kind of dishwashing after the chemistry experiments, I found strangely fun. So she hooked me up with a student work experience with the U.S. Geological Survey. People would ask me what I did, you know, and, and I'd say, well, I worked at the Geological Survey, and they'd give you that quizzical look like, what? You're a kid. It's like, well, yeah, I'm a dishwasher in a lab. Now, the dishes might be a $400 piece of quartz glassware, but I have to say thank you to that 10th grade chemistry teacher that spotted something in me, and she started me down a road. Growing up, nuclear energy was scary and bad. So if you had told high school me that I would be a nuclear engineer, there's no way I would have believed you. But in grad school, my advisor sold me on the, the nuclear field because it's the most extreme environment a material will ever see. You know, it's getting ripped apart at the atomic level all the time and you've got chemistry going on and temperatures. And so I got kind of sucked in through the science. And then as I learned more about how it really works and the benefits of nuclear energy and low carbon, energy, it's, it's really cool. John, can you explain the importance of your work on the Global Research Reactor Conversion Program? So we do work in an odd little niche, but it, it is one that's very satisfying to work in. 
you know, our team works together around the world to maintain the remarkable science capabilities of uh, special class of research reactors while reducing the risk of nuclear weapons proliferation. These machines we work on are so amazing because rather than producing power, they use the neutrons from nuclear reactions to do all kinds of neat science. So we want to make sure with our program that they can continue to do all of that science and engineering work, but using a fuel that can't be used to make nuclear weapons. So Laura, what has surprised you the most about the projects you've worked on at Argonne? Probably the breadth of impact. When we're in the lab doing those coatings, right, your focus is on getting this one batch coated and done and getting the shipment out. It's kind of this narrow focus, but seeing how far that impact of, okay, so this plate was made at Argonne, we coated it, we did a small component, but then, you know, the fuel went to France to get fabricated and then it got sent to Idaho to get irradiated. And now the results of that experiment is going to have impacts across Europe. And then seeing all the different backgrounds of the people that I get to work with at Argonne from across the world. I love the fact that at the lab, we get to work with the best people from around the world. And that's great, not only for what we do at the lab, but then when we do these projects where so much of our program is focused on systems around the world, it's always helpful to us within the hallways to have that broad and diverse perspective. And then when we go out and work in the world, you know, we can really enjoy the diversity rather than being afraid of it. And uh, I see that as one of the gifts of working with such an international crew at Argonne is we're always able to understand the global perspectives of things because it's just part of our daily experience. Argonne Voices is an oral history project recording the stories behind decades of world-changing science at the laboratory. To learn more about Argonne's 75th anniversary, visit anl.gov. So let's meet the engineers behind those voices, John Stevens and Laura Jameson. John is a senior nuclear engineer and reactor physicist with 30 years of engineering experience. He leads the reactor material management program in the nuclear science and engineering division at Argonne. And he also leads an international project focused on nuclear reactor conversion. Laura is a principal engineer and a member of the fuel development department in the chemical and fuel cycle technologies division at Argonne. She supports nuclear fuel development activities and performs research to support two nuclear reactor conversion programs. John and Laura are going to provide, share a bit of information about their work, and then we'll move right into some conversation. John, would you start us off? Thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you to all of you that have joined us this evening. I really appreciate the chance to talk about the, the work we do. Um, we find it very enjoyable and impactful, and it's great to be able to share it with you. Next slide, please. So we mentioned in the uh, Argonne Out Loud, uh, uh, or excuse me, the Argonne Voices uh, clip there, um, the fact that we work on a set of reactors that are focused on doing science rather than making power. As Mark mentioned, uh, when we split an atom, we get both energy and neutrons. And we work on a class of reactors in our programs where we use those neutrons in order to do a lot of interesting missions. This slide focuses on maybe uh, uh, some of the impacts that are most directly involved in the lives of all of us that are together tonight. And yet we probably don't know, most people, uh, that it takes a, a research reactor to create the isotopes that are used for these important missions. For instance, medical imaging with Molly 99 that becomes Technetium 99 is used over 30,000 times a day in the United States to help diagnose a variety of diseases from cardiac to cancer. When it comes to uh, treating disease, some of the isotopes produced in these reactors are also very helpful and in interesting ways that don't require surgery or full body chemo in order to treat the cancer. For instance, the palladium 103 that's mentioned, uh, we can take a very tiny amount of isotope, put it in a, a small uh, glass vial about the size of a grain of rice and insert that directly into a tumor such as prostate cancer or liver cancer. And the uh, tumor will be damaged, but not the broader part of the body. Uh, these isotopes are also useful for industry, such as 
checking whether or not our bridges are uh, still uh, uh, strong and uh, resisting the weather. Um, the isotopes allow us to essentially x-ray through steel and concrete in a way that x-rays themselves can't penetrate. And then finally, in the, these examples, agriculture uh, makes great use of uh, a variety of isotopes to uh, study the soil and uh, the aquifers and help us understand where we need to apply water, where we need to apply chemicals in the most efficient way to get excellent crop production, but with minimum damage to the environment. Next slide, please. So isotope production is one of the key missions of research reactors, but there's actually many. And because of that, all the reactors are very different, which is very fun as an engineer. All the different systems we work on are unique. And so a, a neat technical challenge. On the left, we see a, a reactor in Argentina uh, that's used primarily for education and training uh, as Argentina has sought to uh, not just buy research reactors from others in the world, but to deploy them themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. The GAR-1 reactor next to that uh, is a reactor in Ghana uh, that is used for education and training, but more than that, it's used for uh, what's called neutron activation analysis, where small samples of material can be inserted down next to the reactor, brought back out and, uh, and uh, queried, uh, and we can find out incredible detail about uh, what the materials have. That's used for agriculture, for mining, and even for some very interesting uh, forensics in archaeology and uh, uh, criminal investigations. At a whole different scale, as we go from a half a kilowatt to 30 kilowatts, uh, excuse me, 500 kilowatts, 30 kilowatts, to then 30 megawatts, uh, so a thousand times as much energy in the Maria reactor that looks like a plumber's dream there. That reactor is very unique because its purpose is to produce medical isotopes and also to irradiate fuel to find out how fuel performs uh, in order to be able to apply it for uh, advanced reactor applications. And uh, each of those tubes is feeding water into a test channel and out of a test channel. So if the fuel uh, has any behavior issues, we'll know exactly where it is and how to clean it out and begin studying it. Uh, so uh, very interesting reactor. And then finally, the KUKA reactor on the right is not even cooled by water. It's so low, that is not a typo. It's really the energy level of a 100 watt light bulb. Um, but one of the unique features about nuclear science is that even at very low power, we can learn about how the reactions are taking place and how we can use detectors to track them. So tremendous variety. Next slide, please. One of my joys is uh, going out and talking to uh, students. And uh, over time, they ask me, well, you know, these examples are kind of interesting, John, but what's the coolest one you've ever seen? So this beautiful reactor in blue uh, is the RHF reactor at the Institut La Langevin in uh, Grenoble, France. Uh, it's a 53 megawatt reactor, so very high power. And hence, it gives us that beautiful blue glow. And on the right, you see uh, one of the instruments, and you may have to look closely to notice that there's uh, a male and female researcher there looking together at, at uh, some of the results. And part of what fascinates me about that image is the detector behind them, that tube, is a uh, 15 meter long, 45 foot long uh, detector. We need huge detectors in order to look at the smallest things. And in this case, what we see is that uh, they're able to take a look at how living lung tissue in Petri dishes can absorb oxygen. Some of the lung tissue is healthy, some of the lung tissue is diseased. They try pharmaceuticals, and rather than just getting a binary answer of it either helps or it doesn't help, they're actually able to go beyond that and figure out how it helps. How does the absorption of oxygen change? Uh, so it's incredibly impactful. Uh, for them to take this next frontier of medicine and, and get beyond just simple yes, no answers and get to the whys. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what does our program actually do? I'm showing you reactors around the world, not reactors that currently exist at Argonne, uh, even though we had a hand in, in uh, figuring out, especially through the CP5 that Paul mentioned, how research reactors should be built and deployed around the world. Uh, so 
back when these were done, and many of these reactors were deployed uh, about the same time my parents deployed me, so in other words, they're getting old. Uh, some have been deployed just in the last, uh, since 2005 is one of the most recent, uh, but most of them go back to, to the 60s. And at that time, uh, we weren't worried about nuclear proliferation of weapons in the same way that we are today. So if you were only looking at the uh, efficiency of the scientific mission without considering any misuse of the materials involved, it so happened that using high enriched uranium, the same material that could be used to make bombs, would make a good fuel. And so a number of reactors, uh, about 150, uh, were deployed around the world by us and then the Russians and then a few by China. And uh, unfortunately, the fuel for those reactors could, if it got into the wrong hands, be used uh, to make weapons. Uh, so in 1978, Argonne scientists and engineers figured out that, you know, we can clean up that issue. At, in the 70s, the, the notion of organized terrorist organizations had become sadly clear. And, uh, and so uh, it was determined by Argonne talking to the government that, hey, this is something we ought to do to change the fuel and in this plot on the y-axis, you see what's euphemistically called the strategic value. Uh, what that means is the higher you go on that curve, the more useful the material is for weapons. And on the x-axis, you see what's the percentage enrichment of the fuel. And what we do is move from that upper right corner down to the sweet spot, where it so happens we can get excellent performance if we do our job right, and yet be of no real value to weapons at all. And so that's the program that, that we uh, are talking about the most tonight. Next slide, please, and my last. So we've done this work since 1978. And one question that might be reasonable to ask is, aren't you done yet? Uh, because each of the reactors is unique and because the missions they do are so critical, we actually have been very careful as a program to develop the tools and technologies that allow us to work to keep that scientific mission while reducing the risk. Going from left to right, this shows the progress we've been able to make over the decades, and it has been strong. At first, we didn't have the fuels we need that Laura's gonna talk more about. And so uh, it was rather slow to get started, but then we got the first tranche of uh, a new fuel that would allow us to meet mission. And so we got pretty good uh, uh, improvements as we go to the second image and then uh, after uh, that fuel had been deployed, it got easier to deploy. And uh, sadly, after 911, the world noticed how serious the terrorist threat could be. And so we began to put more money into buying that fuel and applying it in reactors around the world. So to date, we've been able to complete the job uh, at 71 conversions and 32 shutdowns. Uh, we've finished whole continents. We do have work ahead of us. And so people like Laura, are working really hard to, to make that happen. So I've kind of given you a programmatic overview of what we do. Uh, Laura is going to talk more about the actual technologies that we used in order to get the job done. Laura? Thanks, John. Um, so yeah, John introduced a lot of the research reactors, uh, and I'm going to start talking about the fuel. Next slide, please. So first, uh, I'd like to talk about, about some of the facilities that we have at Argonne that enable us to do some of this research into new fuel systems. Um, there's advanced coating lab, so we can actually make novel materials. Uh, at Atlas, there's a material radiation station, so that allows us to create changes in materials that simulate the damage that they would experience actually operating in a reactor. Um, the IVM is one of my personal favorite pieces of equipment at, um, at Argonne, because I actually did a lot of my graduate work with it. Um, it's a microscope that allows you to actually see the damage and see the change in the materials taking place. So you can use ions and simulate um, neutron damage, but you can actually see the different defects in the material forming um, at the same time. So usually you get a snapshot of before and after damage um, and change in the materials. And in this case, we actually see it evolve. And finally, the Advanced Materials Laboratory is uh, next level capabilities that we're really excited about um, being established at APS as part of the upgrade. And that's gonna actually allow us to start looking at higher activity, so more radioactive materials um, at the APS. So we could actually do some characterization of larger sections of material from a uh, nuclear reactor itself. 
Next slide, please. So we talked a lot about research reactors and here's a uh, history of the development of research reactor fuel to kind of show you some of the challenge in converting all of these reactors. Um, initially, a lot of the fuels were high enriched uranium. So it's really efficient at producing neutrons. And depending on the particular scientific scope and mission of the research reactor, there was an evolution of fuel types. So you went from a metallic alloy to dispersion fuels, you have particles mixed in with the matrix. Um, and then going through, once you started with the RERTR program, we needed to convert a lot of those reactors that were operating with this really you know, efficient, high enriched uranium fuel, maintain the mission, but go to a lower enriched uranium fuel. In order to do that, we had to bump up the amount of uranium in the fuel system as a whole. So that led to developing even more fuel systems. Um, one of them was a uranium psilocyte dispersion fuel, um, and two that are currently under development. Sorry, um, the drilling sound that you might be hearing is because I'm getting some Teams messages coming in um, on my phone. I apologize for that. Um, so two of the fuels that we're currently developing are both uranium molybdenum alloy fuels. One of them is monolithic, so it's a just a foil of material, and the other one is a Umali dispersion fuel. Next slide, please. So um, I talked about Umali dispersion fuel. The second or the first image there is fuel particles in aluminum. So you take uranium molybdenum fuel, disperse them in aluminum. Um, and although it works well for certain situations, we're trying to really get at those last couple of reactors that John mentioned in his slide that are challenging to, to convert. Um, the second image shows a Umali fuel particle um, in an aluminum matrix, and then there's, which is the aluminum is the bright color, um, and then the very dark phase there is a pore. So what can happen is the uranium and the molybdenum can react with the aluminum that it's next to, um, create an interaction layer, which is that medium gray color, and then all the fission products, so um, that are produced can kind of go on together, form these really big bubbles, and then you end up resulting in really poor fuel performance. Um, in order to mitigate that, one of the experiments that I worked on, which is Empire, was looking at applying a coating to those Umali particles to really block that interaction between the matrix and the fuel particle. The image on the right shows a really zoomed in picture uh, compared to the one on the left of showing the Umali field particle, the coating, and the aluminum matrix. And this was actually irradiated at Atlas um, with ions instead. But at the very bottom, those two smaller pictures labeled uranium and aluminum, um, it's basically the green is showing where all the uranium atoms are in a sample, and the blue is showing where the aluminum atoms are. And what this is actually showing us is that we're not getting that mixture. So if we had a lot of the interaction layer forming, we just kind of get a mishmash we just see blue and green everywhere. Um, so showing that the coating was really effective. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit, step back a bit and talk about different fabrication processes that we have at Argon and walk through how to create a dispersion fuel plate. Um, so it starts with arc melting. So you can actually create the fuel alloy itself for uh, further processing. So you basically melt it and form it into a pin. And then we atomize the fuel where we actually create the fuel particle powder. So you take the pin um, and you spin it really, really fast. And then you melt it from the top down and it spews out particles. You can think of it as a radioactive cotton candy machine. Um, and then we collect those particles and then we coat them, as I mentioned. So we have two different coating facilities at Argon. Um, one can use that to build coatings using the atomic layer deposition device. So you add on, um, really literally build it up one atomic layer at a time. So it's a pretty slow coating process, but really precise. Um, another facility that we have is a physical vapor deposition device and that you can get much thicker coating quicker, um, but may not be able to get into all the nicks and crannies that you can with atomic layer deposition. Next slide, please. Um, so the rest of the dispersion fuel plate manufacturing process, um, first we mix the matrix material with the uranium powder. So this is an example actually we're showing um, aluminum and tungsten. We use tungsten a lot in some of the, when we're trying a new manufacturing technique because it behaves fairly similarly to uranium, but we don't have to deal with the radiological 
concerns. Um, then we compact that mixture to form the fuel meat of the dispersion type fuels. This is basically just apply a bunch of pressure and end up with something that's kind of similar to eyeshadow or blush. And then we take that compact and we put it in a frame and cover it with aluminum. And then we roll that um, with a hot roll. So it's kind of a really big high temperature uh, pasta roller to reduce the overall plate thickness. Um, and then we finally can trim the plate to its size. Uh, this one in the image here is actually the size that was used in the Empire radiation that I mentioned. So it's four inches by one inch. So it's quite a bit smaller than what would be used in a lot of those research reactors that we're trying to convert with the fuel. But the smaller size allows us to look at a lot of different parameters at the same time. Next slide, please. So lastly, I mentioned the Empire radiation experiment. I wanted to give a step back and take a look at really the number of people that are involved and the number of groups involved in making a global fuel fabrication effort specifically for the Empire experiment. So first the fuel started at Y12 and that was sent to Cary. And then Cary made it into fuel particles and then they sent that to Fram or to SCK, CEN and to Argon. And those two facilities, so we coated the particles with the atomic layer deposition, so one layer at a time. And SCK, CEN used PVD. And this enabled us during the experiment to really compare how those two different coding techniques function, if they work the same or not. From there, uh, particles were sent to Framatome, where they fabricated the vast majority of the fuel plates that went into the Empire experiment. From there, plates were sent from Framatome to INL, and Argon actually made a couple of the plates uh, that went into the Empire radiation experiment itself. And INL irradiated these fuel plates at the ATR. Um, the experiment was successful. We didn't have uh, any broad, any huge fuel performance issues, uh, no leaking plates or anything like that. And we're currently working um, with a collaborative effort to analyze all the data that we have now gotten out of Empire. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you, Laura and John, for sharing a very interesting overview of your research and development activities. You've set us up for a great conversation this evening. Before we start, I'd like to remind our audience to join the conversation by asking questions, and I will include the questions in our discussion. Uh, to ask questions, please use the Q&A um, module at the bottom of the screen. Um, The two talk bubbles are the Q&A module. Our presenters will answer as many of those questions as uh, we have time. So to start us off, while folks are in questions, I'd like to ask the following question. So you both shared that you are part of a global program that produce, promotes nuclear nonproliferation. John, how would you characterize Argonne's role in this program? Well, we've been very fortunate at Argonne uh, to be leaders uh, from the beginning. Uh, in 1978, uh, it was Argonne uh, scientists and engineers uh, that came up with the idea of converting uh, the fuel of the reactors while still maintaining mission. Um, they worked from the beginning then uh, with partners at Oak Ridge down in Tennessee. But since that time, uh, the way we've been able to succeed across the globe is by recruiting more and more partners. And uh, while doing so, we have maintained the lead in what we call the reactor conversion aspect of uh, helping people do the design work, the safety analysis, uh, helping to make sure that the fuel that's uh, being developed and fabricated is gonna meet the needs and then actually implementing the project. So helping people work through all of the supply chain details and uh, regulatory approvals, et cetera, to get the job done. So we're the leaders of that. And there's now a total of 10 national laboratories. Um, we're one of them uh, that have pieces of the program where uh, one of the things I love about the Department of Energy is uh, they use the experts that they need to get jobs done. Uh, that makes me very happy as an engineer that likes to solve problems, and it also makes me very happy as a taxpayer. 
Um, so uh, so we, we do have people from many labs uh, contributing. Um, the, uh, the fuel irradiation work is led by our sister lab in Idaho and the fuel fabrication work on development before it's ready to go out to industry is led by uh, our sister lab at the Pacific Northwest Labs uh, out in Washington State. Oh, thank you, John. Laura, anything you'd like to add? Um, I think John pretty much covered um, our role pretty, pretty well. Um, and then beyond just leading that, um, we are still involved in quite a bit of the other pieces of the conversion. Um, so on the, for USH PRR, so the US research reactors that we're working on converting, um, we've got the lead for the reactor conversion pillars. So those are the folks that um, I give them some of the fuel data and they take that and figure out all the neutronics and thermal hydraulics, um, all that fun science. It's a little bit beyond my, my background, but they figure out how to make the reactor really work and make sure that we can maintain that performance. Okay, thank you. So we have a question in the chat. What happens to the electrons during the fission process? John? Uh, so in the reactor, uh, they pretty much get uh, absorbed right away. Um, however, uh, in the process of slowing down, um, that's why we get that beautiful blue glow, um, Serenkoff irradiation. So, uh, the excited particles uh, are actually moving faster than the speed of light uh, when they're born, um, and they can't stay that way, and so they have to give up energy. And uh, oops, I hope I'm not glitching out. They, uh, I must have uh, insulted an electron by talking about that. Um, so uh, they they give off the energy in that beautiful blue glow. Uh, and I have to say, I, I guess one of the ways I know I'm a nuclear engineer is um, that is literally like the prettiest color I know. Uh, and, and so it's a pleasure to get to visit uh, facilities and, and see that. Yeah, thank you, John. So Laura, I have a question for you about new reactor materials. Um, usually a new material or alloy is placed in a reactor for a long period of time, um, perhaps at, at the advanced test reactor in Idaho or elsewhere. Uh, is there any consideration using proton beams at similar energies, such as at Fermilab, that might expedite research into new materials? That's a great question. Um, in particular, the Fermi, the proton beam we haven't used, but um, one of the things that we can do at Argon is use ions um, to simulate the neutron damage. So rather than doing an experiment that might take a couple years in the reactor, and then you're having to deal with um, a highly radioactive fuel plate to do characterization. We can actually use ions and we can get that same level of damage on the order of about a week. And then we don't actually end up with something that's um, any more radioactive than our starting fresh fuel. So then we can take that um, and use our, we don't have to work in a big hot cell or anything like that. We can use uh, standard uh, microscopy techniques to characterize it. Thank you. Um, John, a question for you. If, we're to, if we are to eliminate fossil fuel as an energy source, we must have a major reliance on nuclear. However, current water-cooled nuclear technology is extremely expensive, and the regulatory requirements sometimes can seem almost like a nightmare. What are the innovations that will make nuclear simpler, safer, and far less expensive? Well, that's a great question. And I, I think there have been uh, a prior out loud uh, that talks about it. I hope it was recorded. It may not have been because it, uh, I think, was before the era of, uh, of our Zoom calls here. But um, so uh, I'm so glad you asked the question. Uh, I, I live and work in a, a division um, like Marx. We have four divisions at Argonne who are what I like to call our nuclear family, and we work across them. And many of our people are working not on the reactors we're uh, sort of focusing on tonight for research and test reactors, but on energy systems. And uh, so Argon, since the beginning, has been a leader in uh, liquid metal cooled reactors. So the EBR1 reactor and the EBR2 reactor uh, showed that uh, we can produce energy very efficiently by using liquid metal as a coolant instead of water. Uh, it also uh, has some great safety attributes uh, that allow a simpler system 
that will be as safe as uh, the, the fleet that's uh, performed so well or even better. Uh, and so uh, that is one of the sorts of reactors that are being considered uh, and one that Argonne has particular leadership in. Um, there's also reactors that use different salts. Instead of liquid metal, they use uh, molten salts. Uh, and uh, those reactors are, are being pursued. Um, other laboratories have had the lead design role. Um, now, uh, industrial partners working on those uh, designs. But Argonne has very important involvement in uh, the modeling of the system that uh, enabled the designs. Um, and then Mark's crew over in uh, the Chemical and Fuel Cycles Technology Group does a lot of great work about what does salt behave like at different temperatures and under irradiation and after long use, et cetera. So um, really helping to, to make sure we understand how you would industrialize that technology. And then there's also gas cooled reactors um, where helium is used as the coolant. Uh, and they have some resemblance um, to the notion of uh, a, a turbine used in a natural gas plant where the heat is coming from nuclear instead of coming from uh, combustion of gas. Uh, and you then run the, the heated helium uh, through uh, uh, the turbine. So those are several technologies replacing water. There is also work going on uh, to uh, have the next generation of water reactors made in a more modular and uh, more factory built pieces instead of on site pieces, simpler systems. Um, and Argonne is involved in all of these types of efforts uh, in addition to the work we do in research and test reactors. Uh, thank you, John. Great, great response. Thank you. Um, Laura, there's a question. Um, asking if you could explain a little bit more about why is the fuel coated? What are the benefits and um, you know, how does it improve the performance? Great question. Um, so as I was mentioning in the talk, so we have the fuel particles in a matrix and we like the, the dispersion fuels, they can be easier to manufacture. So if you get fuels that need to be in a particular shape, dispersion fuels can kind of lend itself a little bit easier to that technique. Um, but what was discovered in earlier experiments when they were um, erating that fuel on a couple of different test reactors was that there's a lot of interaction that happened between the alumina matrix and the umali. Um, and what ends up happening is because of the particular characteristics of that interaction layer, um, it can lead to an accumulation of fission gases and then you get lower thermal conductivity. So then your plate temperature starts going up um, in the absolute worst case scenario, which only happened a couple of times. Um, but the fission gas has accumulated so much that it actually, instead of being a nice flat plate like this, it pillowed and formed like that, which is not ideal if you're wanting to take your fuel out ever again. Um, so we add in the coating there to basically provide a barrier between the aluminum matrix and the Umali fuel. So um, it can prevent those atoms from really interacting um, with each other so you can prevent the formation of that um, additional phase that can lead to all those different field performance problems. And, and Laura, I think, you know, many have uh, an understanding of nuclear fuel in rods, um, long rods, pellets, or metal slugs. Can you say a little bit about research reactor fuel? You touched on it a little bit in terms of plates, but could you say a little bit more about configuration? Yeah, um, that's actually one of the other really interesting things about uh, research reactors. So you do have some that are just in rods, similar to some of the power reactors. Um, there's plates, as I mentioned. Um, those plates can be curved. Uh, some reactors even have, they'll have um, concentric circles. So they'll have cylinders going down and then they'll have concentric rings of those. Um, those ones can either be circular, hexagonal. I think there's some square ones. So. Um, there's even once we get the fuel system figured out, there's then the manufacturing challenge of, okay, we know this fuel at least perform well, but now how do we make the same shape so that, you know, the reactors don't really wanna change out their entire core just to convert. So we've gotta really maintain their ability to use their reactor that way as well. Thank you, thank you. John, question, um, an important question dealing with nuclear systems. And I imagine, uh, it comes up quite often with uh, converting research reactors. 
What's the status of storing the nuclear waste? What do you do with the fuel that's taken back? So that is sort of a frustrating one to an engineer because technically uh, we have technologies that uh, can uh, help us to recycle useful material and to segregate uh, the small amounts of uh, uh, material that, that aren't useful and, and just need to be uh, put in safe storage. Um, when it comes to research reactor fuel, uh, the quantity of fuel involved is much lower. Um, so, you know, we're talking about a couple tons of fuel per year for the whole world. Um, and so actually when we have, I, I only really mentioned one half of uh, the mission. Um, sometimes it comes up in Q and A actually that we really focus at Argonne mostly on converting the reactor to use the LEU fuel. Well, that implies that the HEU fuel you used to use is there. And, and uh, we actually don't wanna just leave it in storage all around the world. We bring it home uh, to the country of origin. So part of the international cooperation, if the US is the one who sent out the weapons usable material, we're gonna take it back. Uh, if Russia did it, they take it back. And then in our most recent uh, conversions uh, in Africa where China had exported a few reactors, um, small quantities, but they took it back. Um, so the idea is we take it back. And in that case, we actually have been able, uh, because we do need to make sure that that weapons using, usable material is, is not going to be used by weapons. Even the rest of the world reminds us that uh, we ought to do that ourselves. Um, so we actually have uh, recycled that material to be able to then be used for power production at the low levels. I do want to point out power reactors have never used this enrichment of fuel. Um, at, at the uh, plants in the U.S., uh, 100 plus that are, are producing power for us, um, they all use fuel that's of no weapons value. So that is an important distinction. Um, so I hope that answers the question. We do know how to store it. Um, the quantities are very small. So even in the case of our power fleet, uh, you know, the footprint required uh, is on the order of the size of a football field and, you know, tens of meters deep. Um, so when you think about how much energy we get out of the nuclear fission, uh, the amount of material it takes to create that energy uh, is much, much smaller than when we think of combustion uh, because of the fact that we kind of get a million to one advantage in the amount of energy by splitting an atom compared to burning one. I hope that's a somewhat helpful answer. Yes, thank you. That was a very good answer. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to decide who, who will answer this, but have all the U.S. university research reactors been converted to low enriched uranium? Do you want um, me to I take that, Laura, or do you want to? Go ahead. So then, okay, I can check. Um, so most of them have, but there are a couple that are being tricky. So there are uh, higher power reactors, so we're still working on converting those. Um, I actually mentioned that when um, with the lead for the RC pillar that does actually include some research reactors um, at universities. So there's one at MIT and there's one at um, Mer Missouri, Missouri, Rala. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, yep. not Rala, right? Missouri, Columbia, forgive me. Columbia, yeah. Yeah. And those are uh, really remarkable machines, especially, um, I, d I don't want to. Uh, uh, not highlight MIT, especially since my direct boss is an MIT grad, but, um, but the MER reactor, I must say, is one of my favorites because it is the most uh, important isotope producer for medicine and industrial applications uh, in the U.S. Um, and one of the very best in the world. Um, MIT does tremendous science uh, for materials science and uh, some other work that, that's very important. Um, but you might've been able to tell from my presentation, the medical connection of isotopes is, is a particular passion of mine. So I love MER. Um, yeah. We have converted 28 reactors in the US. Um, so we have led by example in this program uh, around the globe. And it's one of the reasons that we've been able to form those partnerships with countries, even countries that we didn't have particularly friendly relationships with uh, because we were asking them to do something that we had already done at home. Uh, and, and it made it a much more compelling uh, argument. So John, so John you, you've teed up the next question perfectly for me. Um, as we're converting reactors from the HEU to the LEU fuel, 
are there political issues that have slowed down or blocked the progress? And can you say a few words about that? So politics and money are definitely uh, something I didn't realize would uh, be as much of my life when I, when I decided to go down the engineering route in grad school. But um, on the other hand, it, it is fascinating um, to be able to work with people uh, around the world and work through those issues. And I mentioned that one of our strengths in political negotiations uh, is to highlight the fact that we've led by example as a nation and we've led by example uh, as Argonne. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have core values at Argonne that we're very proud of. And, and one of them uh, is respect. Um, one is impact. And uh, I think we're certainly doing that by preserving mission and uh, by reducing the risk of nuclear weapons. Um, but I'm also really pleased to work uh, where the value of respect is so important. We need to understand why the nation that we are talking to has their nuclear science and, and their aspirations of what to do with it. Um, for the institution that operates the reactor, we have to be mindful of any disruptions that might put them in a, in a difficult position for securing their funding, et cetera. Uh, and of course, you know, their people are, are top-notch people and they wanna stay that way. So they want their equipment to continue to function at the highest level. Um, and, uh, and then for the whole supply chain, um, we have to respect the fact that uh, as we change people from one fuel to another, um, there's a global supply chain that, uh, you know, we want to make sure we look at our interests, but we also want to continue to be able to build partnerships by respecting those uh, uh, different partnerships that already exist in the world. So um, I, I think it, it's been important to have all of those as we work through uh, the political challenges. Um, and then there's the financial challenge that also has politics behind it. Um, here in the US, we are uh, an important uh, player in terms of doing a lot of the R&D that enables this work. Um, but then uh, we're joined by countries around the world through the International Atomic Energy Agency or by just individual donor countries uh, like the UK or uh, Sweden or Norway um, who will pitch in and, uh, and buy an entire new core for a, a reactor elsewhere in the world or such. Um, so there's politics behind lining up the money as well, um, but, but we have been able to, uh, to work through that. And of course, that's one of the reasons that we work in partnership uh, with our, our feds. Um, the actual government employees that we work with are mostly not scientists, they're mostly political scientists. And uh, they've been trained in foreign affairs and trained in the political science so that together we show up at the table with the right mix of skills, um, both from different technical disciplines and then with the, the uh, very important uh, expertise in the, in the politics. And I should say beyond the DOE, we work uh, with the broader government. The State Department has been absolutely instrumental to uh, getting all these partnerships to, to both start and function to success um, along the way. Mark, we you, have Mark. five minutes left for Q&A. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Laura, John brought up uh, the Argonne core values, impact, safety, respect, integrity, teamwork. How does incorporating these core values in your work provide the foundation for advancing the science? Um, one of the big ones is definitely safety. Um, so I mentioned, you know, we're, up, we're making fabricating fuel, so we've got uranium and radiological concerns. So we have to make sure that we're operating that safely. In addition, um, we do have large fabrication equipment. So you've got to um, be aware of that and have the proper uh, work planning control in place to make sure everyone stays safe while we're doing that. Um, another really instrumental one is teamwork. And that's both at Argonne and globally. So at Argonne, I can't do my work without the support of technicians that are helping keep my equipment running. Um, health physics technicians that make sure that all the controls that we put in place are still operating the same um, and that we can handle everything safely, um, my colleagues. And then externally, um, we're working with collaborators around the world um, and within the US to analyze all this data that's being gathered. Um, so forming that 
um, camaraderie and be able to really talk with someone um, is, is really important to be able to just kind of get down to brass tacks, look at the data um, and be able to dig in. So uh, teamwork's definitely across the board been a really impactful one of the core values. Thank you, thank you. So final question along personal reflection. So John and Laura, your work is the, at the forefront of a global program to the, reduce the risk of nuclear proliferation. What does it mean to you to know that your efforts are literally creating a safer world? John? You know, I, I consider myself really almost unbelievably fortunate uh, to get to work in this and with the people I get to work with because uh, the idea of, as a nerd, uh, you know, helping enable other people to do the science that is going to diagnose illness and treat illness and keep our bridges standing and, and uh, help our agriculture and mining, uh, that kind of impact is something that, you know, engineers exist to solve problems. Um, and, and to be able to leverage our individual effort and help other people around the world solve those problems is great. But I'm also a dad and I wanna make sure that the, the world that comes along for my grandkids and beyond uh, is, uh, is one that has less risk of uh, what I grew up with. Uh, I'm old enough uh, to remember our very deep fears of nuclear Armageddon. And, uh, and it didn't get prettier when we saw uh, the terrorist attacks of 911 and such. And I, I know that we are making a real difference. And by removing HEU from civilian commerce, not having to ship it around the world and be transported, we really are helping reduce the risk of those weapons. Thank you. Laura, thoughts? Yeah, um, it's really nice getting that question because I think sometimes or often I can get real focused on, okay, I need to complete this specific experiment and I don't take a second to like step back and look at that bigger impact. Um, the fact that I'm able to be involved in a project that has such a huge impact globally um, is just, it's really cool. It's so interesting to be able to be involved in it. Um, and it's really exciting to be able to say that, yeah, making, making the world a better place. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, our, our time has run out. I want to thank you both again, as well as our virtual audience for engaging in this conversation. Um, our audience questions have been thought provoking and your perspectives have been very uh, insightful. So thank you both. And I'll turn it over to Robin. Thank you so much, Mark. We've come to the end of our forum, but before we close, I'd like to thank you, Mark, I'd like to thank Paul, John, and Laura for sharing your insights with us. It really has been a wonderful conversation. Uh, and the members of our virtual audience, I want to thank you as well uh, for attending and for your thoughtful questions. This event has been recorded and will be emailed to you for listening again and for sharing with your friends and family and colleagues. I'd also like to encourage you to take a listen to some of our other fascinating conversations that are part of our Arg Argonne Voices um, oral history series. Just visit our website and in the search box type Argonne Voices. We hope you've enjoyed this last Out Loud for the year. We have some terrific programs and topics lined up for you next year. And so uh, we hope you'll join us and we hope you'll look out for the evites that will come your way. But until then, be well and have a good night.